Hello. Welcome to another session of uh, Digital Slide Review and Sign Out. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel coming to you from the University of Oklahoma Medical Center here in Oklahoma City. Our program is part of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, uh, a product of the uh, Digital Pathology Association and PATH Presenter. Uh, our case today uh, is a case uh, from the files of our uh, cancer center, the Stevenson Cancer Center. It's a 77-year-old woman who came in with a, a large adnexal mass that uh, radiographically appeared uh, fairly complex with septations and uh, variable uh, thickenings of the uh, mural wall. Um, and that, of course, is concerning. Uh, she's a bit on the old side. Um, and that raised the question of, you know, what kind of tumors we tend to most commonly encounter in the more elderly uh, population. Um, I've looked at this sort of as two ways, what just sort of generally, what are, what are the most common things? Uh, and then by morphology, how might we start thinking about this as we begin to approach the frozen section? Of course, you've got malignant neoplasms, most of which will be carcinomas. But there are certain benign lesions, fibromas, uh, cystadenomas, and so forth that can pre uh, present at this age group or be incidentally discovered. Um, and then, of course, the borderline tumors uh, and metastatic tumors. Additionally, sometimes endometriomas, endometriosis can present as a late mass, uh, but because this also can be complicated by neoplasia, that's important to consider. Other things like abscesses, uh, uh, other sorts of uh, pseudocysts and so forth, these are much less common at this uh, age group. When you think about the cystic lesions, uh, a fair number of these simple cystic lesions will be benign, cystadenomas or maybe borderline tumors, endometriosis. Uh, it's the ones that begin to have some solid complexity to it, uh, where you begin to think about uh, possibly carcinoma, still some borderline tumors in this area, uh, but also uh, you may want to consider germ cell tumors or excuse me, granulosa cell tumor and other sex cord tumors. Uh, germ cell tumors would be very unusual in this age group. Uh, and even teratomas, uh, sometimes teratomas, if they've been there a long time, can also be complicated by secondary somatic type malignancies. And then the more solid uh, lesions, you may have small cell carcinomas or high-grade serous tu tumors, endometrioid tumors, um, Brenner tumors, uh, transitional tumors, uh, and of course, the, the various stromal tumors that can be encountered here. So it's a rather lengthy list. And that means that most of these tumors are gonna to come to you for frozen section evaluation because it's just not feasible to do a biopsy beforehand. And while they're operating, they need to know what do we do next uh, once we've got this uh, tumor removed. So uh, that raises the question of, of how to manage these things uh, grossly. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, in this particular patient, however, uh, this was our lesion. As you can see, there's some solid areas there were large cystic areas and the wall was somewhat fibrotic. Uh, we can see uh, at low power, there's some complexity to the uh, uh, microscopic appearance. We have uh, smaller cystic spaces lined by a, uh, a cuboidal and papillary uh, type epithelium. Um, and so uh, at uh, low magnification, we might say right off, this looks like a uh, low grade serous tumor. Um, and uh, most likely we would be thinking in this situation uh, of a borderline tumor. This sort of uh, morphology with uh, micro papillae in this pattern uh, ought to alert us to that possibility uh, right out of the bat. Uh, really from the very first time the slide hits the stage, you ought to be able to identify this pattern as being a serous borderline tumor. And then of course, you'll want to examine it on a higher magnification and pick up and see if it's uh, got maybe high grade features or something else of that sort. Um, at low magnification, though, there are a couple of other clues that may warrant attention. So notice this area here. Uh, that's an area where, gee, that looks a little different than these other areas. Uh, so I'm going to want to look at that. And then, of course, uh, we've got another area over here that uh, conveniently located within the green dots of similar sort of uh, appearance. So uh, we'll go down on this one uh, right off the bat. Um, and here we see one of the very characteristic patterns of uh, microscopic stromal invasion. And that is this uh, micropapillary pattern. Uh, here we see sort of an inverted uh, appearance where we have a central core, a peripheral cleft, 
uh, and these uh, epithelial cells projecting towards that uh, clefted space, uh, that is uh, indistinguishable from, uh, micro, from invasive carcinoma, um, though in this situation, because it's a very small focus, uh, we would term it uh, micro uh, invasion. So let's go and look at the other uh, area that we identified at low magnification uh, and see if indeed the same thing is going on here. Uh, and in fact, yes, we can see now uh, that here we have these cleft formation, uh, the cells projecting towards the cleft, um, and even uh, maybe perhaps even a few single cells uh, or very small uh, groups of cells. So this inverted papillae uh, pattern uh, with the, the uh, papillary excrescence is uh, separated from the stroma by a small cleft, rather than the reverse where the uh, projections are into a lumen, uh, is uh, the uh, hallmark feature of microinvasive uh, uh, tumors. So this is uh, an instructive case. These are not uh, common findings. Uh, most of the serous borderline tumors that you will see will not have uh, this degree of atypia. Um, there are not a huge number of these sorts of cases in the literature, but there are some. So let's think about uh, this uh, with just two foci on one slide. And mind you, this was after about 18 or 19 other slides, uh, each with several sections in them um, that uh, had not contained anything that looked like this. Um, it's not surprising that this is not a diagnosis that you need to make on frozen section. If you make it, that's fine. Uh, and certainly on frozen section, you do want to sample the tumor sufficiently uh, especially any solid areas uh, that, uh, and any heterogeneous areas that you can speak reliably as to the character of the, neo, of the neoplasm, and especially so that you can answer the question. And the question is, do I need to do more staging? Do I need to biopsy peritoneal samples? Do I need to take lymph nodes? Do I need to remove the omentum? And so forth. So when you give them the diagnosis of a a serous neoplasm, probably borderline, uh, that's enough. They don't need to know if it's microinvasive. They don't even know, need to know if it's low-grade serous carcinoma because that is enough to trigger uh, staging evaluation. On the other hand, when we come to permanent sections, then it's important that we sample very liberally. Now, traditionally, the rule of one section per centimeter of tumor has been appropriate in the ovary. Uh, and this is largely anecdotal. There are some studies uh, that seem to indicate that you can detect uh, the lesions with this, of, of significance with this frequency. However, in the case of borderline tumors, I think most observers, uh, most gynecologic pathologists recommend that you do more, and, and probably two sections per centimeter uh, is a much better threshold. Now, mind you, these don't have to be, uh, uh, these, there can be more than one section of tumor in a given block and therefore on a given slide. Um, so uh, going back here, uh, this was just one section, uh, but if I had taken one section here and another section over here, that would have been uh, counted as uh, two sections uh, and sufficient for evaluation. Well, let's, uh, oops, excuse me here. Well, let's go back here. All right, so let's go on to talk a little bit further about what defines microinvasion. And this is a problematic uh, area. As you can see here, quoting from a uh, recent article, a standardized quantitative criterion for distinguishing microinvasion from frankly invasive carcinoma within a borderline tumor has not been established. And varying definitions have been used, including one millimeter, two millimeters, three millimeters, five millimeters, and 10 square millimeters as the upper limits of microinvasion. So in other words, since there are not standard criteria, what do most people use? Well, I think most people use something in this category, but they also will accommodate this issue by providing a number of microinvasive foci. 
So um, my recommendation is that you enumerate both the sizes and the number of microinvasive foci that you have been identified. And then, more importantly, uh, ensure that patients get follow-up and poss possibly included in studies so that the long-term biology of this uh, can uh, be more fully understood. Right now, uh, and this is a fairly recent article talking about the issues in uh, serous borderline tumors, as far as we know, serous borderline tumor with microinvasion does not appear to adversely impact survival. Um, and it also does not appear to be highly correlated with progression to disseminated disease. Um, it may be associated more frequently with the presence of invasive implants er elsewhere and therefore be classified as low-grade uh, serous carcinoma. Uh, now, we've seen the inverted papillae, uh, or micropapillae, rather, micropapillae fa fashion. There are also larger micropapillae, that pattern of uh, infiltration, and the more single cell uh, or very small groups of cells uh, pattern of invasion as well. Uh, in looking at the number of uh, and ages of these patients, uh, on average, 55 years is about what's been reported in the literature. Uh, but there's a very broad age range. And as you can see, our patient at 77 is even a bit beyond this. Um, so it's, uh, it's, not, it's skewed toward the older patients um, uh, in terms of the borderline category, uh, because I believe the average age for borderline tumors in general would be somewhat younger than this. Um, but certainly it is uh, uh, associated with uh, uh, or capable of, of uh, having a long-term survival. Uh, but having recognized them in the primary tumor certainly ought to prompt a very careful search for uh, in invasive implants elsewhere. So our final sign-out uh, diagnosis on this case today is uh, atypical proliferative serous tumor or borderline tumor with microinvasion. Uh, we found two foci less than three millimeters on one slide. There was one on an additional slide for a total of uh, three uh, foci. Well, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, if you like this video, please uh, subscribe and maybe share it with uh, your colleagues. Um, we always uh, welcome your comments uh, either directly uh, or to us uh, in the form of comments uh, beneath the, the video here. Um, and uh, until next time, thanks so much for joining us.